What is wrong with understanding, having some situational understanding about the country for which we are here to defend? And I personally find it offensive that we are accusing the United States military, our general officers, our commissioned, non-commissioned officers, of being, quote, woke or something else because we're studying some theories that are out there. This response is pretty political, don't you think? Isn't the military supposed to stay clear of picking sides? Join me now, representing Florida's first congressional district, Congressman Matt Gates. Congressman, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, so, Congressman, a lot to chew on here. I guess first I'll start with the military aspect and wokeism infiltrating it and this idea that it would be acceptable to start a teaching critical race theory in the military when we know the contents of critical race theory, which is actually racism. It's racist. The critical race theory is explicitly racist. It is explicitly Marxist. I love our military. I love our military families. And I want to have a military that is capable of ensuring an additional century of American dominance in the world. But we look at our principal competitor, China. They're building more ships. They're fielding hypersonic weapons. They're not doing critical race theory and training on various types of white fragility. They're not out there doing gender reassignment surgeries for their service members or veterans. I am not opposed to our military members. I'm opposed to the senior leadership at the Pentagon that is acting in contravention to the patriotism expressed by our military. And if you want to distinguish, Steph, the study of something for appreciation versus its embrace, look no further than the story of Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Lohmeyer, which you have covered on this show on In Focus. He was someone who was relieved of his command because he was critical of critical race theory. It is clear that our military is on the side of the Woketopians at the senior levels, and that poses a grave risk to our country and the fighting men and women who wear the uniform. Exactly, and we're so thankful for all of those who serve. And a lot of people, if you ask them, folks who are in the military, they're totally against critical race theory, but they're afraid to speak out because they know the consequences as of the example you just gave us. Um, so for these military generals to be flirting with the idea that all white people are inherently racist because that's what critical race theory teaches uh, is really disturbing to me. No, you're totally right. And the whole notion of the military is unity, common purpose, common patriotism. And what so many people appreciate about the military is that as a group, you're going through the same training, having the same experiences, the same mission objectives. And so when you inject something as divisive as critical race theory into the ranks of our military, you cause our troops to otherize one another, to come to that service with a sense of personal grievance rather than a sense of unified collective patriotism. That is why this is something more than just a bad political ideology. It is a destructive tool that will have a very corrosive effect on the fighting units. And you know who I hear this most from, Stephanie? Minority members in the military. I have units in my district that are majority minority, and in particularly those places, they don't want to be told that they are uniquely fragile or disadvantaged. They want to believe that they can make a contribution to our country just like anyone else. There's nothing wrong with being white, nothing wrong with being black or any other color. We should judge people based on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Destructive is a good way to describe it. It's also humiliating, and I don't see how that's going to unite people in the military. Uh, it's not a uniting thing, and so that's why we've seen uh, those parents at the school board meetings losing their minds mm -hmm. over the fact that their kids are being taught critical race theory. And so these young kids are being taught that they have the wrong skin color. That is, white children are being taught that they have the wrong skin color. And, and how is that helpful in, in the school system? And why are our taxpayer dollars going towards this? Yeah, I mean, you look around the world and more and more countries are investing in the pedagogy of STEM and skills and science and coding. And here we've got a new professional educational class that's more interested in this type of liberal indoctrination. And I don't want to raise a generation of Americans that hate one another. You know, I remember going to school and being told that the way our parents went to school in segregated classrooms was wrong, that we shouldn't see race as the organizing principle of our existence, that instead we should try to create unity and to try to link arms with one another as fellow Americans 
happens. And the reason these parents are so awakened, the reason they're so frustrated, is that they see within their own children the poison of critical race theory, and they're not going to take it. Some of these parents, they're going to get elected to school boards, and then they're going to get elected to Congress, and then we'll have more backup to fight against critical race theory. And Congressman, you'll hear leftists say, oh, well, if you don't see race, that's racism. And it's just so ludicrous and it's so absurd for them to say that. They want us to just focus on race and skin color and religion and everything else, uh, which again is very destructive. Um, that being said, th the way that the school board are handling this across the country is um, pretty outrageous. They don't want to listen to the people that they represent. And we saw that in my introduction where parents were uh, cut off. They weren't allowed to be heard. And they had a specific time to be there from like 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock, I believe that meeting was. And parents are getting arrested for speaking out. Um, who are these bo type of board members? I mean, these aren't the people that should be representing parents and, and kids. Well, let's acknowledge a universal truth. Most politicians are motivated by fear. And the reason critical race theory has been adopted in so many school districts is because the board members have been afraid that if they push back against critical race theory that they'll somehow be labeled racists. They'll be doxxed in some way. But now they're afraid of something else. And that is the overwhelming voice of their constituents. The silent majority is getting louder and louder every day in this country, Stephanie. And I think critical race theory will actually be a galvanizing force for the political right in upcoming elections and in civic engagement. So many Americans ask me, how can I contribute? How can I help? I want to make sure that we save this great country. And those who are showing up at school board meetings, reviewing text that is being provided to children, pushing back on these local politicians, they're doing their part. And we need more Americans to swell that cause with energy and enthusiasm and to push back against this very elitist notion that all throughout the country, we need to adopt something that creates more division than it does unity and sense of common purpose. Well said. Uh, I wanted to shift gears here and, and ask you about Biden's latest push to tackle the crime surge in this country. It's nice that he's finally accepted the fact that there has been a crime surge in city across our country. We know why this is happening because of defund the police, releasing criminals from jail early, mm -hmm. and also the constant attacks on law enforcement from political figures in this country. That being said, Biden's solution is actually to go after guns. He wants to go after our Second Amendment rights, and he thinks that that's going to solve the problem. We also have video of him talking about it. Roll tape. The Second Amendment from the day it was passed limited the type of people who could own a gun and what type of weapon you could own. You couldn't buy a cannon. Those who say the blood of the, the blood of patriots, you know, and all the stuff about how we're going to have to move against the government. Well, the tree of liberty is not water with the blood of patriots. What's happened is that there are never been, if you wanted to think you need to have weapons to take on the government, you need F-15s and maybe some nuclear weapons. The point is that there's always been the ability to limit, rationally limit the type of weapon that can be owned and who can own it. Congressman, your reaction to what he just said? In that monologue, Joe Biden seems to misconstrue both the Second Amendment and the nature of crime itself. The Second Amendment has never been more important in our country because Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are doing everything to make our neighborhoods and our communities less safe. They've turned the border into a turnstile. They've embraced policing policies and uh, corrections policies that are totally out of touch with the mainstream of the country. And then, just as you say, they're not targeting the criminals with their anti-crime efforts. They're targeting law-abiding Americans. And we would have to note that in the places that have the strictest gun control, like Chicago, you have some of the highest instances of gun violence. So they are unable to correlate their prescription with the problem. But Joe Biden also gives a very dis disjointed history lesson there. It is true that the purpose of the Second Amendment is to maintain within the citizenry the capability to maintain an armed rebellion if necessary. Now, I certainly hope that that is never necessary. I want to make sure that we solve our problems in the absence of violence in the United States, but ensuring that the people do have the rights to bear arms creates a balance of liberty. It is yet another protection for the individual liberties that have made America the most prosperous country in the world. And I think Joe Biden not understanding that poses a great risk. And if you look at who this guy has put in charge of the ATF, it is very scary. The ATF was picking on gun owners 
owners when Donald Trump was president. Imagine what they're going to do now. And again, it's not going to solve the problem and just make people sitting ducks in this country as the crime surge continues and also open borders right now, total chaos at the border. And so it just it's really mind boggling that they've shifted, acknowledged the crime surge. Now they're going want to go after guns. It's totally crazy. Me was finally able to plea her case to a judge calling for her father to be removed as a conservator. At a court hearing yesterday, she said, quote, I've been in shock. I'm traumatized. And I just want my life back. Now, Britney's situation really highlighted the horrors of conservatorship in America, even attracting the attention of lawmakers. One of those lawmakers being Republican Congressman Matt Gates. Gates got involved in the Free Britney movement a few months ago. And with Congressman Jim Jordan, they led the charge on the issue of court order conservatorship. And he joins me now. Congressman, thank you again for joining us. Uh, so, Congressman, tell me what got you started on this and why you wanted to get involved. Uh, in the state of Florida, where I live and throughout the country, there are millions of Americans affected by conservatorship and guardianship abuse. It's almost like a modern day form of slavery where you don't get to make your own decisions. And so when I stepped up with Congressman Jim Jordan to lead the Free Britney movement in Congress and the broader movement for reform in this area of law, we were attacked by Jamie Spears. And now we see, as a result of Britney's testimony yesterday, how much she loathes and despises her father and accuses him of all kinds of misdeeds and maladies. We know two things as a result of Britney's testimony yesterday. First, she wants to tell her story to the world. This is not a Britney Spears saying, leave me alone, let me live my life in private. She wants to use the experiences that have happened to her to cause broader change. And I think we ought to give her that opportunity in the United States Congress. It's why just today, I renewed my call in person in the Judiciary Committee to the chairman to bring Britney Spears to Congress to testify. And the reason her testimony would be so helpful is that she has endured a unique degree of abuse at the hands of her guardians and conservators. I mean, the financial theft is certainly uh, just jarring, but when I read that Brittany wasn't even allowed to make her own decision regarding the removal of her IUD to have a child to get married, it just seems like no person that has made millions of dollars should be subjected to that. And even if she still needs mental health service, we shouldn't stigmatize that by forcing her to live in such abusive conditions. And if we can do this for Brittany, then I think we can vindicate the liberty interests of millions of Americans who are impacted by this abuse. Yeah, it sounds like modern day slavery the way that it was described. And you're so right. Some of the other things that we heard about the fact that she wasn't allowed to have children if she wanted to. And part of I mean, she's been working all these years, obviously very successful, even had a show in Vegas. And part of the reason she was going to work was so that she could have time to spend with her kids and her boyfriend because they were using that as a carrot on a stick. It's like you don't do your work, you don't see your family. It is totally inappropriate for a guardian to force the ward into conduct that the ward wouldn't do for the benefit of the guardian, not the ward. But here's what's so telling, Stephanie. Once someone is in one of these guardianship relationships, you can almost never get out. And the status of law right now is that the federal courthouse door is closed to anyone claiming that their rights to life, liberty, or property are deprived as a consequence of these guardianships. And so the House Judiciary Committee has the unique opportunity to take what has happened to Britney Spears, to allow her to tell her story, and then to use that to build bipartisan reforms. And by the way, this should not be a Republican or Democrat issue. You. There are Republicans and Democrats that are abused by this system, and I think we should all want to ensure that if people are rehabilitated, if they get better, that they have an opportunity to live their own lives, access their own money, start their own families, and live the American dream. And the father's argument was that uh, when he stepped in, she only had $2 million left in her account, and she was having mental health and substance abuse problems. So that was his argument for taking over. But considering she's been a working woman and has been very successful, and it looks like she's cleaned up her act, uh, I don't see any problem with it. Well, Congressman, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it.